We are on a subject called the weapons of our warfare. This is part two today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of break up the message in a sense into two because uh, one of the weapons that I'm going to talk about is the weapon of giving. Amen. The weapon of giving or the weapon of generosity, the weapon of releasing our faith in the area of giving. But let's go to our foundational scriptures on the subject of the weapons of our warfare. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. That the entrance of your word, Lord, brings light. And I ask that today, as I bring forth the word, that the Holy Spirit hovers and broods over the word, that the Holy Spirit massages the word into our hearts, that the Holy Spirit convicts us, the Holy Spirit teaches us, that the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom and direction and illumination and revelation knowledge. We thank you. We thank you for the weapons of our warfare. We thank you that we are armed and dangerous to go out and take territory from the enemy and to walk in victory in our own personal lives. In Jesus' mighty name, if you believe it, say amen. amen. All right, go, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse 10. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. <laughs> Man, I just feel the anointing so strong here. <clears throat> that you may be able to stand against the wiles or strategies or tactics of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So we need to understand here that we, are, we cannot be strong in the flesh. We cannot be strong in our own strength. You know, we sort of opened the service today by the word of the Lord that came, and I don't, you know, people don't realize that, but none of that is scripted. I just get up here and follow the Holy Ghost, and... The word was to surrender and the word was to yield more, not to try harder, not to strive harder. Trying harder, striving harder in, in your own physical strength, in your own flesh isn't going to get the job done. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So if we are to be strong, we are to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And the word for might there is the same word, dunamis, which is power, which is what Jesus talked about that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Amen. So, because we don't wrestle or we don't war against physical, natural, but against invisible things behind the scenes of principalities, which are high-ranking demonic forces, against powers, those are like the second tier in a sense. Against rulers of the darkness of this age. And against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So we are dealing with demonic forces, demonic wicked spirits that are in the realm of the spirit. In the realm of the spirit. In the spiritual realm. So you can't see these things visibly in the natural realm, in the physical. But they do manifest in the physical because they have people who yield to them, sometimes unknowingly and sometimes knowingly. They know exactly what they're doing. There are people that are in this world system, the globalist antichrist world structure that are very much, they're not, they know exactly what they're doing. They're full of devils. They are Luciferians, occult practitioners, and they're hell-bent on destruction of freedom, liberty, mankind, and everything that is good. So we need to understand that. Nothing is as it seems. When you pull away the curtains of the natural, you look into the realm of the spirit, there are, there's a lot of strategies and tactics, wiles of the devil, plans. Evil is not random. Evil is organized. Amen. So we have to understand that we are in a time of warfare. We sounded the battle cry last year. 
I gave a message that we are not on a cruise boat. boat. The church is not a cruise boat. We, we are on a battleship. Amen. And I sounded general quarters because unfortunately much of the church has been acting like they're just on some kind of a cruise boat, cruise ship, just having fun and just eating and drinking and being merry and just relaxing. But we are in a time of war. We've always been in a time of spiritual warfare. Amen. And we have a real enemy. He's hell-bent on destroying our children, our teenagers, our families. The concept of marriage, morality. There's a warfare in the realm of economics. There's economic wars. There's information war. There's all kinds of war. Biological wars. We are dealing with an enemy that has weapons and he's turned them against mankind and because mankind is ignorant and deceived and has come under the strong delusion of the last days, many are not aware of what's going on. People very easily get sucked into the narrative. I'm not led by mainstream media. I'm not, do you understand me? Anything mainstream is means compromise. I'm, not, I'm also not a part of mainstream Christianity. Mainstream means compromised, watered down or compromised. So I'm, I'm not led by those things. We are to be led by the Spirit and we are to be led by the Word of God. And the Spirit and the Word work together. Can you say amen? amen. So we are told to therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So we are in a, you know, I, it, this is so interesting. I, I had a pastor friend. I used to go do ministry for him here in America. And we had the amazing revivals there, but then just, they just kind of decided to go seeker friendly. And they said, you know, one time they said, we're going a different direction. I'm just going to sit on a bar stool, give a 20 minute coffee shop talk. And we're just cutting down our services because we want to grow and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, and one of the interesting things that happened is um, one of the times I went, the Lord put it on my heart to begin to expose things that are happening. And, um, and we're, we're kind of behind, you know, in, in the green room or in the, in the office. And it was almost like he just wanted to cover his ears. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I believe the world is good. I want to believe the best. I want to walk in love. Love believes the best. And to me, yes, love believes the best. But the world is not good. The world is wicked to the core. And he just thought that, you know, I was just too far into talking about conspiracy theories and other things. And of course, you know what a conspiracy theory is, right? Things that were conspiracy theories six months ago are realities now, you know, but... You know, the whole laptop was a conspiracy theory, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, of course it was. And that's all tied to Ukraine, by the way. All the money that's been laundered through Ukraine for the global elite. I'll just leave it at that. But um, <clears throat> he just said, I, I don't want to believe. Bible tells us we are in the evil day. We are in the evil day. Are you kidding me? You know, if you want to just cover your ears and go, la, 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 I just want to go watch a movie, go to Starbucks, drink a skinny latte, la, 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 all is well, all is well. We're just walking in love. And I think that's a twisted concept of walking in love because we are told to hate evil. So we don't love evil. We love people, but we hate evil. And we have to expose evil. And people freak out when you start to expose evil. And you know, here's why. Because the level of, let me, let me tell you, oh my Lord, the level of evil at the highest levels, it is so grotesque, it is so unimaginable that your average person cannot even comprehend it, actually. When you begin to talk about it, they just freak out, like, no, 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 it can't be like that. Because your average sinner they just cusses, drinks, does whatever they do, but these people literally will sit in board, board meetings or they'll... They'll sit in dark rooms and plot and plan to kill a million people. 
and won't even blink an eye as long as they're making a billion bucks. You know, that, that's how wicked people are. Their consciences are seared. So we are dealing with the strategies, tactics of the enemy. We are in a war time. This is not peace time. Peace time will be during the millennial reign of Christ. Now we're not in peace time. We are in a time and it's the last days that drawing near to the end of the age where demonic activity is increasing. Gross darkness, the prophet says, shall cover the earth. But good news, the glory of the Lord shall rise upon you. So on one side, there'll be, it's going to get darker and darker. The Bible says evil man will grow worse. But on the other side, the glorious church is arising. On the other side, the victorious church is rising up. On the other side, the supernatural end time remnant church full of the Holy Ghost about the Father's business is rising up to get the job done. We are on a mission. We're locked in on a mission. We have very short time. We don't have much time to waste. The days are evil. We got to redeem the time so the days are evil. And so we are serving the Lord, amen, with, our, with all of our hearts on fire. We're not lukewarm or compromised or wishy-washy because lukewarm, compromised, wishy-washy Christians are not going to make it through these last days. You better get on fire. You better get some fire on your tail. Hallelujah. But the good news is, we are told to be strong in the power of his might, and then to take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand. So that means, that, that word withstand also means to resist, to remain strong, not be moved. Hallelujah. In the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. Three times we're told to stand. Hallelujah. We're going to stand our ground. We're going to stand on the rock of the word of God, on the foundation of the word of God, we're going to stand strong. We're not going to budge. We're not going to be moved. Amen. Amen. We're going to resist. Yeah. Hallelujah. We're going to speak up. We're not going to be quiet. We're going to shout it from the rooftops. We're going to shout it from the street corners. Come on, somebody. We're going to go out to the highways and the byways, and we're going to compel the lost to come in. Amen. And we're not going to be a bunch of Pee Wee Herman. Christians, we need some Holy Ghost Rambo Christians these days. And you can see Paul begins to talk about, he's not saying put on your beach shorts and your tank top and grab your beach uh, umbrella and your hat, beach hat, and you put on your little cap and, and, and take up uh, you know, the, the, the sunscreen and and your pina coladas and head to the beach. The cruise ship is coming. No, he says, put on, <laughs> having girded your waist with the truth, the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. He's actually describing the Roman soldier of the day. So he's actually describing a warrior. He's actually describing a soldier. And we are told that we are soldiers of, of Christ. Amen. Why? Because we are in a time of warfare and we have weapons of our warfare and we have armor to put on. Having shut your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Having above all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So you can see these wicked spirits, the hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. How do they operate? Through the fiery darts. Amen. Amen. Through the fiery darts. What are these fiery darts? These are thoughts and attacks that will come against you. And most of the time, the attacks will be either thoughts, they'll be verbal, or thoughts, things that people say, things that people do, and then thoughts that will come to you and the attacks that will come against your life. But you have an armor and you have protection. You have the shield of faith. Amen. Amen. Now, the size of your faith, I pre preached a message, I believe, last year, supersize your faith. Supersize your shield of faith. You can have a tiny little shield or you can have a large, big shield. Bigger the shield is, the easier it is to just to stand behind it. 
So that means you've got to build up your faith. And you need to build up your faith in every area. Because the area where you are weak in faith is where the, where the attack will come and where you won't be able to withstand against the attack. So build your faith up in every area of your life. Build your faith up in the area of your mind. Build your faith up in the area of your health and healing. Build your faith up in the area of provision and finances. Build your faith up in the area, you know, against fear and, and all of these things. You have to build your faith. That means you have to be well-rounded in the Word of God. You can't have your little pet doctrine. Christians love having their little pet doctrines. And they just want to put all their attention and focus on their little pet doctrine. And that gets all their focus and attention. And, and it almost becomes their little idol. But they're so, and, and it's like they're blinded to, to, the, to the rest of their life and the rest of their, the, the, the body and everything that's just exposed. Because they put all their focus on this one little thing. They major on the minors. You've got to be very well rounded with the word of God. That's why here we preach the full counsel of the Word of God. We preach the full gospel. We don't preach a half gospel. We don't preach a quarter gospel. Amen. We don't preach a, 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 God, a God light or gospel light. Skim gospel. We have the whole milk. Amen. Because you need the full gospel. You need the fullness of all that God has promised for your life to be able to stand and to have to be able to build up your faith the shield of faith faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God the more revelation you have in the word of God the more your faith grows and the bigger your shield is that's basically what that means the size of your shield depends on the size of the light or the revelation that you walk in amen little revelation little faith Big revelation, big faith. So you need to grow in faith. We are, we're very focused on helping people grow in their faith here. We challenge your faith. How many of you, you know that we challenge your faith? Come on. Come on. If your faith isn't challenged, it's not going to grow. Hallelujah. You, you have to stretch your faith. You have, your faith needs challenges. If you're not challenged, you will not grow in faith. So that's why if you try to make everything easy and comfortable and convenient, then people won't grow. Welcome to the American church. Cuddling the flesh and tickling ears. That doesn't help you. Amen. Take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts or the arrows of the wicked ones. So you can see the picture is something is coming at you. An attack, a weapon that's coming at you, and you can. This is a defensive weapon, the shield of faith. And then you have an offensive weapon. And of course, the shield can also be used offensively too. You can smack. Anybody ever watched the 300, the, the Spartans? I mean, they banned those guys. <laughs> they decapitated people with their shields. So it's both defensive and offensive. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So that's the other side. You got the shield of faith in one hand and you got the sword of the spirit in the other hand. This is, these are both built on the word of God. So the word of God, that is your weapon, which I will get to uh, in, in the next message. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And prayer, of course, is another important part. Then go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. For, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, or natural. But they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, Amen. casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive or into captivity of the obedience of Christ and being able to or being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, there's so much there. 
But let me highlight a few things. We do not war according to the flesh, which we already saw that the battle is not against flesh and blood. But we have to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and the weapons of our warfare that we have. They are not carnal, but they are spiritual, powerful spiritual weapons for the pulling down or destruction or dismantling of strongholds. What are these strongholds? Arguments. Everything that exalts itself against God's word and knowledge. Every thought. You got to bring every thought into captivity of the obedience of Christ. And the only way you'll be able to do that is when your obedience is fulfilled. So when you are walking in disobedience to the word of God, you kind of don't have authority. You can rebuke the devil all you want, but you're leaving a door wide open. It's like going to bed at night, leaving the doors, the screen doors, the front door, all the windows. Every entrance to the house is open, and you're like, oh, no, a thief broke in. Rebuke the thief. Well, you can rebuke the thief all you want. You got open doors. So disobedience, unfortunately, disarms you. Leaves an open door. So you want to make sure that you are in full obedience to the word of God. So that you can rebuke and take authority and resist anything that is contrary to the word of God. Because it's only the word of God that you walk in obedience to. That empowers you to have the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. Because what is ultimately disobedience? It is doubt and unbelief. That means you actually don't believe and trust in God's word. Because you're choosing your own flesh over the word of God. And if you believe that, well, no, I know what the word says, but, you know. Goats, but, sheep say amen. Amen. Let all God's sheep say amen. I, I know, Pastor, I know that's what the word says, but I know you warned me about that, but. My flesh just likes it too much. And then sometimes, you know, they, the, people are like little kids. They just throw a temper tantrum because I took away the loaded gun from their hand. and Give me back my gun. You know, I, I'm trying to actually help you. I'm trying to actually protect you. I'm trying to actually save your life and give you some wisdom. But if you believe you know better than wisdom and God's word, then you're going to have to go go at it on your own but that's going to be a dangerous place to go to so there has to be obedience obedience when your obedience is full you can see now you can punish all disobedience you know why because when you're in obedience you you you're in the righteousness of god and you are walking in authority and power remember jesus said the the ruler the god of this world is coming and he's got nothing on me nothing nothing on me or nothing in me why? There's, because he was in full obedience to the will of the Father. And so the devil had no, he, that's why when he wanted to throw him off of a cliff, cliff he couldn't. Yeah. Jesus just walked right through. But, it, but when the time came for him to, the Bible says he, he was obedient even unto death. So when it was time to be obedient unto death, then that's when they could actually take Jesus and crucify him. And, and his crucifixion was in full obedience to the will of God because he needed to die for us and pay the price for our sins. And he needed to die for our salvation. That was the plan and purpose of God. He was born to die. And when the time came in the fullness of time, he, said he just went as sheep to the slaughter. Because before that, they could not take his life. He gave his life. When it was time, he submitted unto death. And his obedience was perfected as he obeyed on to death so obedience to the word of god is going to be a vital key for you to walk in power and victory and because any area of disobedience is the area of exposure right so you want to be fully covered not be exposed amen, amen. is this helping anybody here this morning all right so now let's look at the weapons of our warfare the bible tells us for the weapons of our warfare they are not carnal but they are what mighty in god they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So what are these weapons? What are the weapons of our warfare? All right. So we looked at two weapons or three weapons last week. We looked at the name of Jesus. 
and the blood of Jesus. These are weapons. And then we looked at the table of the Lord. That is a weapon. If you were not here last Sunday, I recommend to go back and watch the service or listen through the podcast or I believe it's, you know, now we we put the sermons by themselves also on YouTube. So it's there. Today, I want to talk to you about two other weapons. The first one is the weapon of giving. Somebody said, is is giving my weapon? Absolutely, 100%. The weapon of giving. Let's go to Malachi chapter 6. Sorry, Malachi chapter 3. There's no 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. Thank you. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. It's interesting when God wanted to refer to Israel in the flesh, in in their disobedience, he called them Jacob. Because Jacob means the deceiver. Jacob is the, the old, old man. So why is he calling them Jacob? Because he's referring to their disobedient life, their disobedient nature. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? So returning to the Lord, that sounds like rededication or repentance doesn't it so he's calling them to repent in an area of disobedience he's about to address it and then they ask a question well how shall we return what is our disobedience why are you calling me us jacob why are you referring to us as jacob as the deceiver as the deceitful as the fleshly nature why are you referring to that disobedient nature and the Lord's like, yeah, there's an area of disobedience and you need to return on to me. And then they ask the question, how shall we return? And then God asks a question back to them. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? So again, this is just a question and answer, question and answer conversation. How did we rob you, Lord? And the Lord's answer is in tithes and in offerings. In tithes and in offerings, or in other words, in your area of giving, there's been disobedience. But if you will turn this around, right? And he says, you are cursed with a curse. Wow. Who likes to be cursed with a curse? It's like a double curse. Who, who likes to be blessed with a blessing? Amen. Three of you. Wonderful. Let me try that again. Who likes to be blessed with a blessing? Okay, that, that sounds a lot better. Well, of course, there, there is a way. Obedience e- equals blessing. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. So the entire nation is backslidden because they're not honoring the Lord. And because it's not just the area of giving, the tithes and offerings ultimately represent them honoring their covenant with the Lord. Because it's a covenant of blessing. The Lord said, if you will do everything I've, tell, I've told you to do, then I, I will bless you. And all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be blessed. Even all nations will call you blessed. I mean, you'll lend to many nations and not borrow. You'll walk in victory. You'll be the head and not the tail. You'll be above only, not beneath. And everything you put your hand to shall prosper. Your enemies that come against you shall be defeated before your face. And they shall flee from you in seven directions. I will open to you my heavenly treasure. Pour you out a surplus of prosperity. I'll give you the land in the rain in the land that I have sworn to your forefathers to give you. Every piece of ground you step foot on shall be blessed. I mean, come on. I mean, who likes that? I like that. Come on, somebody. I mean, even your animals are going to be blessed. Your chicken are going to be blessed. Your cows are going to be blessed. Everything's going to be blessed. Your children are going to be blessed. Your house is going to be blessed. Your shopping cart is going to be blessed. Yeah, I said your basket, that's what it is, your shopping cart. Now we just got little bigger, bigger baskets with wheels on them. We call them shopping carts. That means your shopping cart will be filled to the full, overflowing. 
Your storage places will be filled with plenty. Your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. I mean, God is good. He's not like trying to keep something. He doesn't want us to live under the curse. He loves us so much. He's a good father. Every good and perfect gift comes from him, the father of lights, in whom there's no darkness, no shadow of turning. What does that mean? Also, that means when God has spoken a word, he's not going to change his mind about it. He doesn't repent or change his mind. If he said, I will bless you, but here are the conditions, that means you need to walk in obedience to my word and honor me and honor the blessing on your life, then all these things, are just gonna, they're going to keep flowing. They're going to keep flowing. They're going to keep flowing. Amen. Amen. But the whole nation is backslidden at this point. So they're not Israel, they're Jacob. I was like, you wrestled with me, and I blessed you. Because remember, Jacob, he wrestled with God, said, I will not let go of you until you bless me. I mean, he just wanted to grab a hold of the blessing. I want, I want the blessing. And he says, okay, from this day forward, you shall be called Israel, not Jacob anymore. Jacob, the deceiver, was changed to Israel, the one who wrestled with God and got a hold of the blessing. But here they had let go of the blessing. And now they come under a curse and they're not wrestling with God, pressing in for the blessing of God. They're not valuing the blessing of God. They're taking it for granted. And the whole nation is now backslidden at this point. And then what is the response that they need to have? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. In other words, oh, you want to eat food in your house? You want to just keep bringing everything? You're all about your house, but what about my house? And like he said through Haggai, my house lies in ruins while you all build your own houses. And for that reason, I've kept back the wheat, the honey, the oil. And it's almost like you put your money in a bag with holes in it. Right? So, and he says, if you will build my house, consider your ways. If you will build my house, I will build your house. Come on, say this after me. If I build God's house, he will build my house. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I, I, I like the idea of God building my house. Because the Bible also says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. So I don't want to labor in vain. I don't want to strive and, and just work, 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 and then have nothing to show for and put my money with a bag with holes in it. So take care of my house, it says. And, and it says, try me or prove me or test me now in this. Isn't that interesting? It's the only place in the Bible where God says, test me. Otherwise, he says, don't test God. But we can test God in this. You know why? Because it's a covenant. He's bound by his word to fulfill it. Now watch this. Somebody said, well, where, where is this going? How is this a, a weapon of my warfare? Let me show you. He says, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Who likes who likes the windows of heaven open to you? Who likes to having the windows of heaven open? Who likes the pouring out of blessing? Who likes that there won't be room enough to receive it? Who likes, who likes net breaking, boat sinking kind of catch of fish? Who likes their storage places filled with plenty? That's overflowing with new wine. Yes. Now watch this. Here is the weapon. And I will rebuke. The devourer for your sakes. Now, devourer here represents, yeah, it represents the satanic structure. The, the thief that cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. The devourer that wants to devour the finances. And, and not only just finances, just devour your entire life. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. So to me, this is this is a warfare because there is a warfare against your finances. Yeah. The devil does not want God's people to prosper. The devil doesn't want the church to have access to any resources. Yeah. He, wants, he wants to take all the resources to himself because he's a thief. But the Bible says, the, the Lord says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. Right. Everything that I placed upon the earth, I've given it on to you so that you can advance my kingdom, build my kingdom, and, and take care of my plans and purposes and be about my business and my mission right but when we forget it what happens is then the enemy comes in to steal adam actually had the title deed of the entire planet he had dominion over the entire planet but guess what happened through coercion and deception manipulation he ended up 
basically committing high treason and handing over the title deed to Lucifer who became the God of this world. So Jesus calls the Lucifer the God of this world, the world system. The ungodly world system, the political, economic, financial, educational, entertainment. All these different realms of the world system are very much demonic, very much unclean. And, and of course, that's where all the money is. But the church tries to pay the light bill with a bake sale. And we're going to go shake the world. You're right. Yet all along we have a covenant where God says, I give you power to create wealth so that I may establish my covenant with you. When the church is to walk in dominion and power and have access to unlimited resources, for he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that's at work in us. He says, I will give you all grace to make you all sufficient always in every situation right so that you will have an abundance for every good work i don't know what people read they i think they read the scripture like this i will always suffer being lack i will have nothing to do anything good i'll be i'll be no good for nobody always suffering every place i go i'll just be defeated i think people read the scripture like that that's the poverty mentality that demonic poverty doctrine doctrines of devils that have been brought into the church and propagated throughout the centuries that religious doctrines of devils. It's a false doctrine. And it's a weapon that's been turned against the church to strip the church of the resources and the material things that we need to, to get the job done. To propagate the gospel, to build the kingdom. And then it's so interesting to me. Some of these guys that are against, and they, they want to label us, or oh, you're one of them prosperity gospel preachers. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, is there a poverty gospel? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I just preach the gospel. If you want to label it prosperity gospel, why don't you, why don't you label you one of them healing gospel preachers? Well, I don't know. And then you, you, you listen to these guys, and then they write books, and they make millions off of them, and they live in million dollar homes. No, I'm serious. No, it's okay if they have the money. They just don't want the church to have the money. They don't want you to have it. We want everybody to have it. God's no respecter of persons. Everyone can step into and walk in the, in the blessing of God. Come on, somebody. So we can see here, the moment we start to give, we are doing spiritual warfare. Because he says, I will rebuke. See, you, I, I've seen people, man, they're binding. I bind the devil off of my finances. I rebuke the devil like this and that. And then they're still getting attacked because they don't give. If you're not tithing, you can bind all you want. He's loose. So I want you to see this. Every time you tithe, the devil gets rebuked. Every time you tithe and you give, the devil's getting rebuked. Who likes the devil getting rebuked? Now, when I'm giving, I'm rejoicing because of the blessing, but I'm also rejoicing because the devil's just getting smacked. Take that devil. The Lord does the rebuking. He rebukes the devourer for your sake. You know what that means? He's stepping in. Now he's getting involved in your finances. You're not on your own. Now God is building your house. Do you see that? Now he's, now because you partnered with him, you're in covenant with him, now he's stepping in to protect you. Because because you're honoring your covenant, Lord, all these blessings come from you and I'm going to worship you and I'm going to serve you. I'm going to bring all the tithes, the first one-tenth of my income to you. I'm going to bring my offerings. I'm going to be thankful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to worship you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to thank you. And then guess what happens? And God's like, okay, now we've, we've, we're locked in together on this thing. We are in partnership, amen. And so when the devil comes to touch you, it's like he's trying to touch God. When the devil comes to trying to touch your stuff, it's like he's trying to touch God's stuff and God's like, 
take your hands off of that. Take your foul and filthy hands off of it. Don't you touch my child. Come on, somebody. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Who likes that idea? Yeah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to close this part out, and then I'm going to move on to the second part. But I want us to go to Romans chapter 12. I want to show you something here. Romans chapter, and I'm going to share a story with you. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. As a matter of fact, let's just go back to 17. I like to read back from 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, leave peace, peaceably or peacefully with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I want to talk to you about applying the weapon of giving in a different area. Of course, we're talking about giving in the, in the area of tithes and offerings, right? So that it activates the blessing of God and the blessing of God is upon our lives. But also, there's another area where giving is a weapon. When you give to your enemy, it's one thing to give to God, it's another thing to bless your enemy. Because the Bible says, bless your enemy. When I bless you well. This, this, this right here says, not just in words, but in deed. Yeah. Like you got to actually do good. And the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay you. Anybody here ever had money stolen from them? Uh, welcome to planet earth. People lie to you. They cheated you out of things. Who's ever had that? Sure. Are you still talking about how they did you wrong? You singing that country song? How they did you wrong? Living in the slum of offense and I was done wrong. They stole this and they stole that. Well, let me tell you something. You can't live in that realm. That actually, be, that actually becomes a weapon the enemy uses against you. Because you, you remain in a place of offense. And now they, they become your enemy. Every time you think about that person, they're your enemy. And, and now, of course, you want vengeance. But the Lord says, I will repay you. The ven vengeance is mine. So what is he saying here? Listen now. So here's what you got to do. You have to make a decision that no one can steal from you. You're going to give it. I just blessed them with it. They didn't steal from me. I blessed them. I'm going to turn this thing around to my advantage. I'm, 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 I'm either going to be angry, I'm either going to be grouchy, I'm either going to be offended, I'm either going to be talking about it all the time, I'm either going to get, get all upset and get all stirred up about it, I'm, all, I'm either all going to be like, ah, I'm going to live in that realm of the past and miss out on the blessing of the future, or I'm going to just turn around, turn it into a weapon, what the enemy meant for evil, I will turn it for good, right? How am I going to do? I'm going to overcome evil with good. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to bless him with it. I bless you with that money. And I'm going to start dancing. Hallelujah. I blessed. I sowed seed. Now I know the Bible says the Lord will restore unto you sevenfold what the enemy has stolen. But you know what? He says your seed can bring you back a hundredfold. I like hundredfold better than a sevenfold. Come on, somebody. I'm going to weaponize my giving to have the devil rebuked. Because what he tried to do against me to take me down, 
I'm going to use it as an advantage to catapult me to the next level, to prosper, to be blessed, to walk in joy and peace. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I am blessed going in. I'm blessed coming out. No man can curse me. Hallelujah. Now, let me share a little story with you. This one just, I can share many, but this one for some reason just popped in my spirit this morning. This was literally in the very first month or two of, the, of, of starting the church in Istanbul, Turkey. So this would have been like the this December of 1999. All right. Of course, I'm doing revival meetings uh, in Istanbul, Turkey. When we went there to start the church, there was less, there's only about 500 Christians in the entire country of 75 million people. How would you like to be sent into the mission field, which is my home nation, of 75 million people then, now of course probably about 85, close to 90 million, right? Less than 500 born again Christians. And so we're doing meetings, Holy Ghost meetings, and people are coming. And there was a, a couple of young college students that came. And the power got hit them. I gave an altar call. They're up in the front. Uh, what, this one little uh, young lady, probably about 19 or, at the time, she's weeping at the altar. Power God's touching her. Falls out. Gets delivered. Gets touched. And then she keeps coming to the meetings. And I don't know who she is. We're doing a couple of weeks of revival. Holy Ghost meetings. She's coming and getting touched. Then I found out that um, there's a pastor uh, very close to where we were having the meetings. I, I knew the man, that he was very upset that I was doing Holy Ghost meetings, first and foremost. Secondly, I'd come into his territory, I guess. Uh, he's the gatekeeper, you know, how that goes. And then uh, a couple of people from his church had come and got touched by the power of God, so he was very angry with me. And I heard that he was speaking against me. It, you know, I heard it through the rumor, rumor mill. It, it, the words got to me. So I called him up. I knew him. And I think he was shocked that I called him up. I said, hey, my friend, how are you? So it's been a while. You know, I've been in America for a little while and have come back now, you know, and uh, would love to take you out to lunch and connect with you again. And he was kind of like shocked. I know he's like really slandering me, upset with me, speaking, and that's not of God, what he's doing, all that kind of stuff, right? I'd love to, you know, just take you out to lunch and... And uh, he hesitantly, I guess, said yes. So I'm about to heap some hot coals on his head. You want the fire? I'm bringing the fire, man. <laughs> I'm bringing the fire, man. So we go there, and I went. And, and, you know, you have to understand, this is like the first month of the church. I mean, we didn't have the finances. Okay? I mean, I'm believing God. Like, literally, I'm receiving the offering. We're meeting in a hotel. I'm receiving the offering. <laughs> And, and, and we're counting the offering, you know, and then, of course, people said that I had come to take their money. Yeah. We're counting the offering. I got to pay like a hundred, I can't remember, a hundred, two hundred dollars to the hotel. We count the offering, it's like 30 bucks. So I'm adding to the offering from my pocket to go pay the hotel so they would allow us to come back the next time. If I don't pay, they're like, you ain't coming back. So I'm like, it's like a faith walk, you know, yeah. every day. And the word got out because I'm teaching on giving. He's come from America. He's come to Turkey to take our money. I'm trying to get, teach people how to break through, you know. And little did they know, I'm actually having to add to the offering out of my own pocket, believe God, with our own additional things that we need to, to pay the hotel so we can, we'll be allowed to come back. Anyhow, so I go, I bought this very nice silk tie. Had it wrapped, put it in a box. And I'm going to take him to a, a very nice, <clears throat> I'm feeling the anointing on there already, a ke kebab, Turkish kebab place. I, I just feel the anointing right now on that one. Anyways, but, so we go there, and I mean, this place is expensive. I don't, I, you know, like, she's like, we don't, we need grocery money. I said, um, it'll come. I'm going to lunch with this pastor. I'm taking him to a very nice place. And then, by the way, I bought him a silk tie. She's like, what? So we, we, we agree. I'm going, listen, I'm going to meet Mr. Sally. 
he, he shows up and I could see he's coming at me. He's kind of staring at me. And I'm like, hey, you're my friend. It's been a while. How are you? And then I have a gift for you. And I opened the box and this is a silk tie I got. And then you could see the, the label. It's a very famous uh, place in Turkey. And I mean, he, and he just didn't know what to say. I'm sure he was coming to like rebuke me because I could see he was steaming, steam coming out of his ears, nostrils coming at me like this. And I completely disarmed him and he just went like this. And he sat down, <laughs> we had the lunch. I blessed him, we talked about it. And then, uh, and then he goes, I'd like to come to one of your meetings. <laughs> He never did come, but his son came, and the power of God hit the son, and then the Lord touched him, and he ended up coming to America to go to a college, um, Christian college, many you know, years later, and he remained a, a close friend to me, his son. Whenever he was in Turkey, he'd pop into the church. He wouldn't go to his dad's church. He would come to our church. <laughs> So by doing good, say this after me. If my enemy is hungry, I'll feed him. If he's thirsty, I'll give him a drink. For in doing so, I will heap coals of fire on his head. I will not be overcome by evil, but I will overcome evil with good. Amen. So giving is a weapon. You know, because it's coming in the opposite spirit. Generosity, cheerful giving being thankful, you know, being, it's important. And I can tell you many, many, many stories like that. You got to sometimes go wash feet. You got to go wash some feet that kicked you. Man, that, I got a nice swift kick right here. Go wash that feet. I'm serious. Because love, see, love is the higher way. Love is the way to victory. Love conquers all. When you walk in love, and so giving is a form of showing love. Why do you think, I mean, why do we give gifts on birthdays and anniversaries? Why? Because it's just a form of showing love. And the more you love, the more you give. Amen. I mean, if you're about to get engaged with the love of your life, that woman you're about to propose and you don't go to the dollar store and buy a plastic <laughs> toy ring. You're about to be rebuked <laughs> for her name's sake. I hope she does that. No, you want, you want to get a nice big rock. I mean, you, you know, you want to show worth and value. I mean, you want to show love. So the more you love, the more you give. So... Love is the weapon. Giving is the weapon. Hallelujah. That was funny to you. You didn't. No. Just. <laughs> Remember those lollipop rings? Here, I, would you marry me? <laughs> Suck on this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just be a cheerful giver. Be free and just walk in love and, and be a blessing. Remember Paul said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So there's more blessing in giving than receiving. Amen. All right, let's lift our hands. Father, we just thank you as we come to give, as we come to worship you in our tithes and our offerings. We are now understanding that this is a weapon of our warfare. The devil that it comes to kill, steal, destroy, the, the thief, the, the, the devourer is going to be rebuked. He will not be able to steal from us. He won't be able to attack our families, our children, our finances, our homes, our bodies. In the mighty name of Jesus. Because we are tithers, we're givers. We are in covenant with you. We know our covenant. We honor our covenant. And we thank you. We thank you for the power of the blessing that is in our covenant. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.